I just want to um, now introduce our speaker, um, who I'm very excited to um, share with you. So, um, Prospera Tedham is with us today. She's um, previously taught at the University of um, Open University and University of Northampton, and also at Anglia Ruskin, but she's currently at the United Arab Emirates University. Um, before joining, um, her, sorry, her research is focused on culturally sensitive work, equality and diversity, anti-oppressive practice, faith-based abuse, and the experiences of black African social work students in practice learning. Um, in this keynote, Prospera will share findings from her recent research into the experience of black African social work students and practitioners during the year that we've had the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm really excited to hear from her. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end as well, but for now I'm going to hand over to Prospera. Um, thank you. And good afternoon and welcome to this um, keynote um, discussion where I'm hoping that we can talk about anti-racist practice and, and, and my kind of views on why it's, it's timely um, to take this seriously in social work education and practice. Um, you've already been told about what the etiquette is for today, so we're going to leave all the questions and contributions to the end um, and then hopefully we can um, attempt to, or I can attempt to address the ones that have not been addressed during this presentation. So I thought it's perhaps um, important to tell you a little bit, bit about me because that sets that in context. Um, so I, I've worked in, the, in South East England and the Midlands as a social worker. And when I left frontline practice, I left as um, deputy team manager in the children and family specialism. Um, and since 2004, um, I've taught social work at the Open University and the University of Northampton, Anglia Ruskin and in Cambridge. And finally, where I am today, where I'm speaking to you from is the United Arab Emirates. Um, I think uh, Moen has talked to you about my publications and my research areas, and I'm just absolutely delighted to be sharing some thoughts with you today. And, and I guess it's, it's poignant because it's also, um, you know, International Women's Day, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be speaking today about this this topic. So in terms of the presentation, um, I'd just like to kind of um, give you a view of what I hope to address. Um, I'm going to begin by outlining some messages from research um, and then I'm going to talk about or share um, the ideas around reflection and how I feel that reflection is an important vehicle through which we can disrupt racism in social work. Um, I'm going to summarise uh, the key research findings from the current research that I'm undertaking and then finally there's a call for action or a call to action and I think that uh, people who have been listening to me and are familiar with my work this will not this this kind of presentation will not come as a as a surprise. Although I said I'm going to start with these messages from research, what I would want to say is I, I, I really do look forward to a time where um, my work is redundant. Um, and I say it very honestly, um, yes, I may be out of work, but I think that I can I can live with that. Um, but I think that continuing to talk about and research into and um, navigate um, racism in social work education and practice is not something that I, don't, I think anyone wants to do and so the the sooner we are able as a community of social workers and social care practitioners the sooner we're able to recognize that this is not um, a, an area of research that people easily go into and it's not one that's exciting um, and it's not one that 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 has happy necessarily has happy endings so I would be all for this move to to, um, put me out of work. So messages from research. Um, again, I these are the ones that I have selected for today, but I would just want to add that there are so many um, and I wouldn't be doing justice to any of those if I decided I was going to give you a whole list of, of, of these messages. But just looking very quickly, Brockman and colleagues in 2001 um, talked about participants in a study and recognised that um, out of 134 participants, 60 of them reported racism from service users and or relatives and also from colleagues and peers. 
um, you will see that there's an incremental um, approach to this to this to these messages from research that I'm presenting. So in 2009, um, Chana and Dole um, reported a lower number of black and minority ethnic social workers supported to undertake post qualifying training. Um, in 2015, Mubaru Shimana and Robbins um, wrote about ethnic minority social workers in the UK who experienced covert rejection from managers and colleagues and that they felt certainly that group of, of um, participants felt that they had to work harder to be recognised in the same way as other people working normally and ordinarily. And of course, uh, myself um, this year, um, so it's forthcoming. Um, I found in this piece of research that specifically black African social workers experience discrimination and racism during or prior to, but also um, during the COVID pandemic. I just want to draw your attention to again some research uh, or some recent um, some some recent research and ideas around this uh, this disproportionality, if you like. And Samuel in 2020, so only last year, published this piece in Community Care. And I mean that that you see it. I didn't feel I would do it justice if I had, if you like, cut and pasted it or represented it in the slides. And that's why I thought it would be useful to see this as a as it was published in Community Care, certainly online. So the topic catches your eye: black and ethnic minority social workers disproportionately subject to fitness to practice investigations. Um, and it's even more important because the hosts of today, certainly the hosts and, and, and the platform through which this, uh, this, this week of celebrations has been organised, Social Work England, have promised action as these figures show disproportionately low numbers of ethnic minority panel members making the decisions about social workers' suitability to practice. Now, we may have some questions and some thoughts around this, um, but I would say uh, just looking at that and reading that piece, I would suggest that Social Work England's promise to action is actually what we're trying to be talking about today. And I think that's why this particular slide is important, that it it absolutely captures the sentiment that I've come to this discussion with today. OK, um, and just when we thought that was enough, um, I'm going to take you back a few years to 2013, where Tristan Donovan, again in community care, reported a lack of ethnic diversity amongst step up to social work students. And the, the, the topic actually, when it talks about sets off alarm bells, I think is really something that um, if you brought that fast forward to today, I think it would say something like continues to set off alarm bells. And I think that is where my frustration is. And that is perhaps where you will hear me loudest in my um, in my actions. And that's where you'll hear me um, loudest in my activism because I feel that we have been having these conversations for years and years and we make sometimes we make a few we, we take a few steps forward and other times we take we run backwards so you know it's slow to progress but then we rush right back to the beginning so again if we look at um, so that's the that's the topic those are the headlines and if we look at the um the conversation, the, 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 the strap line at the bottom, it says a detailed investigation is needed into why none of the 134, 132 black British African applicants to step up proceeded beyond the assessment centre stage, according to an evaluation of the programme. So I guess for me, if we if we look at these two together, if we look at this from 2013, and then we look at this from 2020, we can probably agree um, on one thing that the target group here um, of the disproportionality in terms of either not making it through an assessment process or being fast track is, is the language I, I've used in some of my research that being fast tracked into um, fitness to practice processes appear to be disproportionately impacting on particular groups. 
so the uphill struggle is ongoing and I perhaps at this point just want to just leave this here for a, a few a few seconds to get us to start thinking about this ongoing uphill struggle and also to start thinking about well why are we still where we are today why are we having these conversations today um it's the 8th of march 2021 why are we still having these conversations and who is behind that boulder have they been run over by the boulder? I mean, has the boulder come right down and crushed them in this process? Or have they gotten anywhere um, further up that, um, that struggle, uh, up that hill? And I think that that is an important consideration and it's the right time to start thinking about reflection. So just to give you a bit of a background to why I feel reflection is in an important vehicle to kind of moving conversations about racism forward is that when I undertook my doctoral study um, about six, seven years now, um, I used or I, I, I employed the use of reflective diaries for my participants. And what I found was so you know, generally speaking, I did the interviews um, and then I, I, I gave each participant, well, not all of them because they didn't all want to support or didn't feel able to, to um, contribute in that way to the research. I left them with um, diaries and I asked that they continue to record some ongoing reflections and ongoing experiences. And it's only when those diaries came back. I mean, to be honest, I didn't get very many of those. I, th I actually think I got two diaries back and one much up, much later after the doctorate was, was, was done. But when I looked at those diaries, one thing that kind of sprang out at me was the frequency of recording. So the participants were obviously writing, putting dates and sometimes times um, and the frequency of it, just looking at those reflections. So they wrote the incident, if you like. I went into supervision and this happened or I was told that. And then they put together some reflections. What was really helpful was at a point they said, and based on these reflections, this is what I'm going to do next. And that's kind of where my idea came from. And I'm still trying to carve that out and to craft that into something that can be published for people to see exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm not going to go into the whole conversation of what is reflection and, and all of that, because as social care, social workers and social care professionals, whether that be in academia um, or in frontline practice or practice educators and, and, and mentors and so on, we understand the importance of reflection. What I am now asking today is that we think about how we can use this reflection to move to, to move the conversations of race and racism forward in our profession, but also to think about how else we might um, utilize or use reflection to improve, if you like, the experiences of people who uh, the experiences of people who who have been subjected to um, racist behavior and racist actions. So the importance of, of reflection then isn't really the, the, the main um, conversation today, but I just thought that I would highlight these points. So reflective practice we know is focused on reflective uh, professional practice, but ref reflection is also relevant to all aspects of our of, of living and of life. So that's Fouke and Aiskland 2006. And we also know um, that Social Work England is very clear that every piece of CPD should include a reflection. Um, reflections hopefully safeguard against rushed decision making. And in 2020, Rawls has Rawls, um, found that or suggested that reflection should move us beyond our comfort zones. And reflection should generate new ideas and new ways of working. So. This is, with that in mind, I move to this idea of reflection for action. I believe that, um, you know, reflecting for action is about thinking about future actions with the intention of improving or changing practice. So this is not um, reflection in action. And this is not reflection on action, although there is an element of that. This is really about reflecting for action. So what do we intend to do in the future to improve or change the racist nature of some of our practice 
and the racist nature of some of our interventions and the racist nature of some of our interactions with our colleagues, our peers and our service users. And so to begin that reflection, I argue that it is about 10 months coming up to a year since the murder of George Floyd. And yet I speak to many practitioners who are still reflecting. What I, I don't want people to take away from today is that I am rushing reflection or I'm saying, you know, um, people need to kind of move on. But actually, I am suggesting that if you've been reflecting for 10 months, certainly we're at a place where we need to just do it. And at this point, I really do like the Nike um, um, label here that, that, that I've, I've put in here. We need to think about what we have learned from the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matters protests. And we need to move beyond that reflection and we need to reflect for future action. This is where I believe this is going. And so in terms of a reflective question for us, something to take away, something to think about, where are your reflections? Specifically in relation to race and racism, where have you put those? Who have you shared those with? Do you actually intend to share them with anyone or do they remain closed in a bottle? Do those reflections remain in your reflective notes that you've written? Do those reflections remain in supervision sessions? Do those reflections remain in the coffee room where you've just gone and had a coffee and thought about and reflected on this? Where are those reflections and what are we doing with them? I, I want to talk briefly um, around some of the reflections in my mind that should result in action and I will revisit this slide at the end of the presentation. But the link that you see um, where I've got ABC News is of a YouTube clip that um, in which the one of the officers was interviewed and it's a really useful um, clip because what you will hear, what you will see from that um, that clip is that the officer, one of the officers who was observing was Officer Thau and his, when they asked him the question about, you know, what was going on and he was, he was sharing his thoughts about what happened on the day. He responded in relation to George Floyd, well if he's talking then he can breathe, obviously. And then there was a female spectator who whilst was while she was witnessing what was going on, she was also recording it on her phone. So she was there when um, the police officer put it, you know, put his knee to the neck of George Floyd. And what she said during the recording of, of, of what she was witnessing, she said, well, you guys should be checking his pulse. You need to be doing compressions if he needs that. You guys are on another level. And that was the female spectator on the day taking the live recording on her phone. And then Officer Thau says again when, the, um, when he was interviewed about why he did nothing to stop his colleague, he said, it was not my job to stop what the police officer was doing. Now, what, I've, what I will do is I'm going to leave that there for perhaps a minute. Um, I have tried to do this with the eight minutes and 48 seconds and it's it's excruciatingly painful. It's actually really painful um, to, to kind of bring home the point about how long somebody um, was subjected to that level of violence resulting in his death. Um, but I won't do that today. Um, I'd rather use the time at the end for, for discussion. But I want you to just look at these questions and look at these comments on this page um, and start thinking about how these kinds of things, these thoughts, these words, um, how these should result in action. So I'm just going to leave it there for a little while and then I'm going to move on. Actually, it's been recorded, so maybe not so long. So just leave it there for a, a minute.
OK. Um, I'm going to move us to thinking about who are the stakeholders in this discussion about anti-racist practice in social work? Who are the stakeholders and who are the ones that will benefit, if you like, and who are the ones that, you know, this means a lot to? I guess all of you who have signed up to listen to this keynote this afternoon are stakeholders, but Really, I don't need to make a list of who these um, of who the stakeholders are in anti-racist practice. I believe it's everyone. Service users, employers, students, universities, social workers, families, the list goes on. Um, and I think it's captured in that word everyone. If indeed everyone is a stakeholder in this anti-racism movement, then why do we have some people on this slide suggesting it's not their job. So we'll have this conversation a bit later. So everyone's a stakeholder. I now want to move you away from this discussion, if you like, this part of the discussion, to then talk to you about my re research, and then we will revisit, as I say, we'll revisit the George Floyd and the comments towards the end of this presentation. So um, I said earlier when I started that I look forward to the day where I don't have um, any data to present on anything remotely related to racism. I look forward to um, being able to research other exciting and happy topics, if there's, if there's such a thing, um, <clears throat> because the more the more of this research I undertake, the more concerned I become about the slow pace that we are taking. I don't want to broaden it to the UK because I, I don't know um, the other um, nations in the UK, but I can speak specifically of England, that the more I have to do this, the more concerned that I am, the more concerned I am that we are not moving at the pace that I think um, we need to be moving. So what is my study about? Um, I recruited 20 participants um, at the, you know, um, during, well, COVID is still ongoing, so I can't say during COVID, but can I say perhaps at the earlier, um, early on um, during the lockdown. And just to give you a bit of a snapshot of the study participants in terms of gender, um, I had four males and um, 16 females. In terms of the specialism, I had five um, who, who, who were working or who work in adult services and 15 children and families practitioners. In terms of qualification, I had um, seven MA st students who had MA degrees and 13 with bachelor's degrees. And in terms of the types of employment, um, we had five locum workers, um, and I did separate out locum. I didn't ask um, the locum workers, or I didn't want to, to, to know specifically the locum workers, whether they were, um, how long they'd been in locum and so on. So just, you know, broadly locum workers, 14 um, local authority slash health, um, and one PVI, private voluntary independent sector participant. Now, a couple of notes down at the bottom um, here to, to help us think about these participants. So um, the, their experiences range from the ASYE to the most qualified or the one who'd been qualified the longest, if you like, um, had been in practice for 22 years. So we've gone from newly qualified, if you like, to 22 years. Um, all of them working in England and all of them, one of the criteria was that they self-defined as Black African. Now, if you're interested in, in my work, generally you will see that I have a, a particular focus on Black African. There's a very long history to that, which I don't want to um, bore you with today. But as you know, it is useful, particularly in times when um, we are using um, generic uh, terminology to define and describe groups of people. I found it quite useful to um, categorize my, my, my research interest as Black African. And yes, there are um, debates about whether even that terminology is, is um, appropriate, but because we allow them to self-define. So basically, um, 
do not sign up if you don't, you know, define yourself or, or, or view yourself as Black African. So that's quite helpful for the self-defining um, as part of the inclusion criteria. So this is just a snapshot of who was involved in the in the um, in this research. Um, again, if you um, are interested in my work, I, I utilize or I use a critical race theory, theoretical perspective in my doctorate. Um, I first became familiar with this um, around the time that Victoria Klimbier died. It's a long time ago now, um, but I became interested in it. And again, it's not something that I want to spend too much time talking about today, but I certainly do need to because my the current study is embedded in, in this. So just very briefly, um, critical race theory, I will start off by saying is under attack, um, has been under attack um, by Donald Trump, specifically in the US. Um, and I think more and more we are getting some of those uh, repercussions or some of that, some of that's feeding into some of our own local um, UK, UK um, ministers, where we have recently had um, the Minister for Equalities also talk about um, you know, research areas or theoretical concepts like this not being helpful. But I stand by this and I, um, I'm happy to be, I'm happy for someone to try and persuade me otherwise, but um, I really do stand by critical race theory. So it emerged in America in the 1970s where it was felt that the law and civil, civil rights movements had not progressed enough in terms of racial justice. And they argued that racial injustice persisted. What I like about this um, theoretical perspective is that it places race at the center of analysis. Um, and so as a critical um, race scholar, I call myself that now, albeit quite quite young in, 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 that, in that regard, um, I think that we interrogate practices and policies that are taken for granted. You know, things that we have done years, year on year and things that we continue to do, um, we interrogate those practices and those policies um, with a view to uncovering overt and covert ways that the structures, institutions and racist ideologies create and maintain racial inequality. I think for me, um, again, as a scholar and as a practitioner, I find it really useful that what CRT does for me is it acknowledges the relevance of um, people's everyday everyday lives, um, the lives and the lived experiences of black people. And I also think that what is important about this uh, perspective is that it recognizes race, um, it recognizes that race intersects with other identities, including sexuality, gender, gender identity, and so on. And so for me, um, it's important that I give some space to analyzing and understanding um, critical race theory within the study. So I've not kind of digressed, if you like, I am still talking about my research. Um, but I'm explaining the fact that I used critical race theory um, to try and help me make sense of what the participants were telling me. You'll see that team, theme two and three I haven't explained, and that's because those are quite, um, you know, I think those are those, it says, you know, um, what it says on the tin. But theme one, counter storytelling, I felt that I needed to explain that slightly. And, um, Solozano and Yosso in 2002, they have defined counter storytelling as a method of telling the stories of those people whose experiences are not often told. And so um, we may have our own views and understanding of why um, black um, uh, service users experience you know, um, have a particular kind of experience. We might have our own views about why black students or black social workers have a particular kind of experience, but nothing beats hearing it from people themselves who say, I will tell you a narrative. I will tell you a story that may counter what you think you know about me, but also what that does is it allows people, it allows my voice to be heard because it's not often that my voice is told, is my voice is heard. It's not often that my stories are told. So theme one is around counter storytelling. Theme two is around everyday racism. And theme three is around whiteness as privilege. And what I did was in the study, I have identified the various um, elements of, or the various narratives that meet these three themes. So, I'm going to share with you some of the findings so far. Um, 
And so in terms of theme one, that counter storytelling, um, I think there was a, a participant who spoke about some managers lack of leadership skills and this is how she I've named her Sylvia um, and that is an anonymous uh, that, that is to preserve anonymity she said they would pretend to be interested in my health and well-being just checking on me they would say but would end each phone call with when are you returning to work and I have to say that with Sylvia she contracted um, COVID during work and was off sick for quite a, a significant period of time. And so what she laments is the fact that the management or certainly her manager appeared to be interested in her health and well-being, but would end each phone call with when are you returning to work? Um, and Sylvia goes on to say in terms of that first theme that, you know, it's time like it's times like this that we recognise or she certainly recognises that um, there are differences in supervisory and management styles. And what she said was, my manager does not have a clue about the impact of the illness on me, nor about how she and her team will support me on my return to work. It felt like she wanted me back to work regardless of my health and well-being. Now, in um, in my in my analysis of this um, statement further, which I'll tell you about because hopefully it's, it'll be published soon by the British Journal of Social Work. Um, but in my analysis, there's some kind of thinking around, you know, she's not Sylvia does not see herself as part of the team. If you look at what she said here, she's referring to her manager and her team. Um, so this kind of otherness or not belonging or not feeling as she be, as though she belonged is kind of um, highlighted in this in this um, in this narrative and within this theme. Um, sorry, what I should have said when I started was obviously because this is um, being published or going to be published soon as a, a journal article. Um, I won't be sharing too much of the, the, the data here. However, um, when the articles have, becomes available, um, I will let um, colleagues at Social Work England know so they can signpost you to that. So I just kind of want to move along in terms of the themes to give you a bit of an idea and then I will um, carry on. So. The next um, participant whose narrative um, reflects the idea or the theme of everyday racism. Um, and for me, this is one that I was particularly hurt by. I, it, it touched me. Um, and just to give you a bit of a background to this, this was around shielding. And so um, Annette is, um, as you know, she self-defined as Black African. And in terms of shielding, her manager was taking requests for shielding. So she'd ac accepted some other, um, uh, Annette would say she'd, she'd accept her team manager had accepted to grant a white colleague shield uh, grounds for shielding therefore you can you can work from home but she said to Annette and I quote Annette I know your parents are in country X in Africa so you won't have grounds for shielding so Annette goes on to say that this comment was really upsetting to her and it resulted in an argument with her manager and she said to me she continued in terms of that interview she says for this I will be looking for a different job when the virus subsides. I won't take any more of this racism. It's got to a point where they are using such language to justify their discrimination. Who even said shielding was about older vulnerable parents anyway? What about my children? What about my in-laws? I even support elderly people in my church. So I guess when we're talking about racism and we're, we're looking at, uh, as my question is, this is the time to talk about it. The everyday racism, the statistics that come, what we hear about everyday racism is increasing, not decreasing. And I'm a bit concerned about why somebody's country of origin um, becomes the ground or becomes a criteria, if you like, for deciding um, who has grounds for shielding and who has not. And this is happening in social work offices and in social work spaces um, in England. And so again, this gives us a view about the way in which we interpret things when we have the power to make determinations and uh, determinations about who is eligible for particular services. We 
sometimes I guess people will sometimes want to call it um, unconsciously um, use this kind of information um, as a way of supporting uh, a decision not to allow something to happen. And finally, um, you know, in terms of the themes, I'm coming to talk about whiteness as privilege. And I'm going specifically to talk about an incident that Carl mentioned in relation to service users. And this is how Carl articulates what I have um, worked out and analyzed as whiteness as privilege. He says, many black service users do as they're told. When we moved to virtual visits and phone calls, they accepted the new terms without question. Our white service users, on the other hand, demanded phones, internet credit, you know, and they were given these. Um, so that's one example of whiteness as privilege that Carl articulated. Of course, he didn't call it whiteness as privilege. He shared this um, narrative and I have analyzed it in this way. Um, Dolly um, talks about PPEs and she said, well, PPE was like gold dust. And whoever knew the PPE administrators would get PPE and these administrators were white. So again, we are looking at situations where, in my view, where whiteness has privilege. And therefore, what Dolly was suggesting was, I'm not likely to get this PPE, am I? Because it is about knowing these administrators and the people who are giving out and signing off these PPEs the people who were signing them off were white, I'm not white. And so Dolly goes on to make further assertions, which hopefully when um, when the, uh, the, 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 the paper's published, you will see. I wanted to add this as well, um, because I think that it was it was an interesting perspective to come with or to come from in terms of understanding this whiteness as privilege. And one of, sorry, I haven't put the name here. Um, I think it's a female. Oh, actually, it's probably still Dolly. Um, and what Dolly was saying was until I left that LA three months into COVID, there had been no risk assessments for black staff. Yet we heard and read that ethnic minorities were dying from COVID disproportionately. It's scary, but what could we do? If I if I hold on to the but what could we do? There's a sense of helplessness here for Dolly. There's a sense of who are we going to talk to? Who's on our side? Who's going to listen? But also the preceding comment about it's scary. And no member of staff should live with in fear and no member of staff should live in concern and worry about their lives. And what she's saying is, it was three months later and there were no risk assessments. So again, whilst the, the, the whilst media, not just social media, but research um, was being produced around who was dying, who was being affected more, who was being infected and affected more by COVID. Um, and we, we, we were told in some of this research that these were black people of ethnic minority backgrounds. You can see why um, somebody like Dolly would be concerned, um, but then, talked about it being scary, but then ended by saying, what could we do? But where is all of this occurring? The racism that I have just described um, and some of the experiences that I've just described up until this point in social work education and practice, where is this occurring? This is occurring at all levels. It's occurring um, for students at all levels. And if I can go all the way back to some of the research that I read for my doctorate, it goes all the way back into um, being accepted into social work courses. And as you can also see from today, it goes all the way back into um, that example I gave using Step Up, where 134 people did not make all 134 black African students who applied, none of them made it through to the next level. So this racism and the experience of of racism is occurring at all levels pre-student then all the way throughout the student journey which is my area of social my area of, 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 of the doctorate because again we know that black students are um, faring less well on social work programs they're graduating later with lower classifications and they tend to have more difficulties and or problems particularly on placements and within practice learning 
We now also know that social work practitioners are experiencing racism. And of course, we know that in terms of management, we know that there is an underrepresentation of social workers from black and minority ethnic backgrounds in leadership roles. And that workplace racism has been found to be a barrier to this progression of black social workers into leadership roles. And that's Bernard very recently, 2021, where she produced, um, uh, you know, uh, some research, if you like, or, or some guidance for the research and practice group. All of this that we've talked about stand in absolute contradiction with what the social work values that we all signed up for. And indeed, when you interview students to um, who are interested in undertaking social work, we ask them, we usually ask the question about why social work? And many of them will tell us about, you know, ethics, about their values, about, you know, love for humanity, respecting diversity, all of that flows very easily off the tongue at the point of coming onto the course. Something happens somewhere along the line, I don't know what. Do we assume as social work educators that we let the wrong people in? Do we assume that um, uh, practice educators let the wrong people pass? Or do we just say that they have entered the profession and something has happened and suddenly we are turning against each other. We are turning against our minority groups within our own profession. So I argue again that all the racism that I've just suggested and talked about undermines Social Work England professional standards. My issue though is which ones? And as you can see, there's a thumbs down right there. But when I say which ones, I'm also quite worried um, that when I look at these, they're great, but you really have got to think about it. And I would, I, I, I guess I would challenge Social Work England, and I know that um, this is the first year we're looking at different things. Um, there's a, an equality and diversity strategy. Um, I think it came out not very long ago, but there's ongoing interest and ongoing look, uh, an ongoing interrogation of the standards and things that are related to um, anti-oppressive practice, anti-racist practice. But I do think there's more to do, and that is why I have set out these standards. I mean, I've taken the, the screenshot of this because we could argue that anti-racist practice falls into each of these categories. But whilst it's not named specifically and explicitly, we are leaving the interpretation sometimes because I'm not I've not gone into the 1.1 and 1.2s, and I guess that that's what social work we're re requiring social workers to do. But I think we need to start looking at how some of these main standards reflect the topic and the area that I'm discussing today. So for me, that is one of the things that I want to um, I want to raise, and one of the, the the areas that I want to hopefully get people to reflect on. So on the next slide, which is here, I do kind of pull out some of the, um, the, the, the detail of the Social Work England standards that I mentioned in the, in the previous um, slide. Um, so 1.5, 1.6, promote social justice, help to confront result um, issues of inequality and exclusion. So I do kind of pull all of that in there. And of course, 4.8 would be in there because it talks about reflection. It, re it talks about reflecting on our own values and challenge the impact they have on practice. But the 20 participants that I, I, I interviewed, whilst some of them had positive experiences during COVID, um, the majority of them did not. So are we saying that we have structural issues, structural discrimination, structural racism, where these structures have become part and parcel of the wider social work um, office, if you like, social work organisations. And at what point are those practitioners and team managers and leaders, at what point are they reflecting on these values and how are they challenging the impact on their practice? And if they've been reflecting since the, the Black Lives Matters and the George Floyd, that is coming up to one year and I come back to my point of we need to start thinking about what we need to do about this. So where's the destination? Where is it we want to go? Um, I believe, as I said early, 
we, there's a reason why um, this this topic has, has has become very important to me and quite central to what I'm doing. We need to take anti-racism seriously, but why now? I believe that it is true of social work education and of social work practice that we do not need any more data or any more evidence around disproportionality to make the case. Um, I don't. I don't believe that we do need any more and I, I, um, I'm happy to be corrected or advised differently during the Q&A at the end. We don't need any more data. Disproportionate number of children, um, black children in the looked after system, disproportionate or who are looked after, disproportionate number of, I don't know, black males who are excluded from school, um, a disproportionate number of um, black females who experience domestic violence um, that, that the police then trivialize or reported to trivialize because oh in your communities you're used to it those kinds of that kind of disproportionate we don't need any more we do not need any more um, and so I do believe that this is the time and that's why it is the time to take it seriously but who like I said earlier everyone anti-racism is every social worker's responsibility. Now we can say anti-racism is everyone's responsibility. I think that will be a cliche that will be out there. But certainly racism has no place in our profession where the um, the, de the very definition of our, our, our um, uh, the very international definition talks about human rights and social justice. So certainly anti-racism for me is every every social worker's responsibility. And there isn't a magical transformation from racist to anti-racist. We don't wake up one day from being racist to being anti-racist. Being anti-racist or becoming anti-racist requires deliberate action. Deliberate and sustained action. Um, the profession really has got to take this seriously. And when we talk about the profession at this point, I'm going to talk about the individual, of course, the professionals as the individual and the personal kinds of racism, but I'm also talking about systems and organisations. Systems and organisations where perhaps the assessment processes in relation to our service users mean that particular groups are disproportionately uh, uh, continue to be overrepresented. Black men, we know, generally speaking, black men, more likely to experience harsher um, interventions from mental health systems. We don't need any further disproportionality statements at all. So we all have got a stake in doing something about it. Taking anti-racism seriously, but how? I think it's by, one, thinking about how our language and actions contribute to racism. The language that was referred to earlier on when I was talking about um, one of the participants, I believe that was Annette, where it was around, well, you know, your family live in Africa, you have no grounds for shielding. Um, perhaps the time that statement was made, they hadn't thought about it. Um, but that's the kind of language that we are working against. We also have to think about the continuous learning and reflection on global and national research. So, like I said, um, things like or uh, theoretical concepts or views like critical race theory have have come into the UK um, from America. Um, we cannot keep compartmentalizing areas of knowledge like this. I feel that there will be some applicability of some of these ideas that are coming from other countries and it's useful to continue to learn about it. And as the um, Social Work England has said themselves that in terms of their CPD, we need to focus on elements of reflection as well. I think we can tackle um, anti-racism or certainly we can demonstrate that we're taking it seriously by pushing past the silence in support of black colleagues. How many black colleagues have been unable to push forward um, uh, formal grievances because the witnesses who were their white colleagues have decided no sorry I've got a lot at stake here or suddenly decided they didn't see what they saw they didn't hear what they heard so we need to push past this silence um, and support our black colleagues when the need arises. And Quintero and Long um, have come up with this phrase that I, I, I like. Um, you'll see why I like it. Um, they've come up with this phrase, toxic positivity. 
And there's a lot of that going on in um, various spheres of our lives, our areas, and of course, um, in, in, in social work offices. And toxic positivity, they have defined as the excessive and ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic state across all situations. So it will get better. Oh, you know, let's go for a cup of coffee. It'll be fine. You'll be all right. You'll... I know that the language of social work is one of empower empowerment. It's one of empathy. But sometimes that empathy and that empowering pushes us to this position of toxic positivity, which means that we in, in, in using that we do not adequately give the right level of support to our black colleagues experiences of, of racism because we're overgeneralizing this optimistic state that things are going to change things are going to be good you'll be all right you know have a cup of coffee let's go back into let's go for a walk it's fine yes i did hear that it was rather unfortunate it was said to you but you know what you've got to look for the you've got to look for that um silver lining you've got to look for the light at the end of the tunnel yes all of that's wonderful but not at my cost and so there is a word, there is a terminology for it now. And that's why I said I like the term toxic positivity, not that I like the term on its own, but it absolutely explains how some of us black people feel or ethnic minority people feel when we experience racism and we're told you'll be all right. It will be better tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day. Those are some of the statements and those are some of the comments that I think that we need to be pushing past. So. Um, as I gear towards concluding this keynote, I'm going back to reflect on slide 11. And I'm going to begin with Officer Thau, who said in relation to George Floyd where, um, you know, well, if he's talking, he can breathe, obviously. And my, my response to that in relation today to today's topic is do not assume that your black employees, colleagues and students turning up to work or turning up to university means that everything is OK. I believe that they may just be existing within a toxic and dangerous environment. The second point that was raised on slide 11, which is you guys should be checking his pulse, doing compressions if he needs that. You guys are on another level. And I, my response to that is employers, HEIs of black social workers and social work students need to consistently apply the welfare check principles to their staff because well-being matters. And then finally, where Officer Thau talks about when they asked him why he didn't intervene when uh, the other officer's knee was on the neck of George Floyd, he said it was not my job to stop what the police officer was doing. And again, my response to that is it has to be your job to prevent suffering, harm and abuse if you witness racism or become aware of it. Now, today I have not, I have given you 40 minutes if that, of a discussion that I've about why I think we need to take anti-racism seriously, how I think we need to take, how I think we need to, to, to do that. And I have used, if you like, the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter to try and explain some of this. And I've also used some of my recent research, which will be published shortly. What I haven't done today is attempt to define race or racism. I'm working on the premise that everyone understands what that means. But what I also haven't done is talk about the experiences of black academics um, in this in this whole or black social work academics within this whole context. And so I want us to see or take this um, presentation, keynote presentation for what it, you know, take it for, for, for the intention. And I feel that um, we need to, in terms of George Floyd, we do not need to switch off when this is no longer the in thing. You know, there is a view that, you know, when things are less trendy, we all switch off. You know, whilst I'm not defining or describing the death and the murder of a man as trendy, I'm simply saying that where social media has has talked about this for a long time, um, you know, for 10 months, people are be beginning to stop talking about it. Indeed, there are some organisations that have not acknowledged 
not acknowledge Black Lives Matter, whereas at the other side of the spectrum, they are the ones that have Black Lives Matter always in their strap line, in their emails. And at this point, I will um, um, name one teaching partnership slash local authority, uh, uh, which is Coventry, that when you send an email to them and they respond in their strap line at the bottom or in the signature, they make a bold statement about Black Lives Matters. Prospera, I don't believe- We've just got a minute left um, before we need to move on. Okay, brilliant. Um, I also think that, you know, all of this starts with us as individuals. Um, Anti-racism and anti-racist education, uh, anti-racist practice begins with us, each person as an individual. And I'm hoping that today has pushed us towards thinking about why this matters now and why we cannot keep waiting for more, any more evidence than we already have. I have um, recommended some resources here. Um, obviously, you can see that they're, they're my own um, because this is the area that I, I work in. Um, and I would like you thank I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and for your time and to thank Social Work England for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Prospera. What a amazing keynote and totally sobering. Um, I feel personally very moved and I know that um, a number of people that have been listening have um, attested to that also. Um, we are out of time actually in this session, but what I'm going to suggest is if you're okay to hang on for another 10 minutes, we'll do a, a few Q and A's and we'll see um, how Laura's illustrated this session as well. Um, obviously we, you know, people um, probably have a school run to do today of all things. So um, we'll let people go, just feel free to leave. But for those of you that are able to stay around and for the benefit of the recording, we, um, there's some fast, fantastic questions. So I just want the chance to ask a few of them if that's okay. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to go to Amina who just wanted to share some of the reflections that have come through um, just for your benefit and for the benefit of everyone else. So I'll just pass to her first. Okay. Hi everybody. I'm so sorry I've not been able to keep up with all of the incredible um, comments and questions that have come through. Hopefully as Moena said we'll be able to capture some of those but I thought it'd just be really um, helpful and just really important to be able to share some of the ones that uh, we've received. So I, some, I'm going to just read a couple out. Um, so somebody's written, I felt really helpless during the beginning stages of COVID, especially hearing that black staff were disproportionately impacted. I just lost a family member and was really worried. I was told that I had to go out as before, as there was no room for social workers deciding not to do aspects of their role. And the manager went as far as to say, what if a child dies? That's on you. I felt awful. There should have been a safe space for me to share my worries, but that was not the case. And I think that really speaks to some of what you were saying, Prospera. Um, mm. Somebody else has commented, um, Dr. Karen Roscoe, actually, there's a name here. So interesting themes and crossover with how to decolonize the curriculum, particularly during pre-placement agreement and black identity vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability apologies, on placement during COVID. Um, somebody else has commented that I think we should be having racism conversations all the time and avoiding the fear of talking about it and there was quite a few reflections actually on people feeling concerned about being judged for speaking out about racism um, and quite a few people advocating um, having those open conversations. Um, I think I'll stop there because I am conscious of time and hand over to you um, hand over to Moena to ask you some questions. Um, somebody did ask just before I go over to you um, if we we're able to share some of these questions with you and um, share them on the website later. So um, we, can, we can have a look at that if you're able to answer a few more than we, able, when we are able to get through. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, thanks, Amina. So um, thank you. That's really helpful reflections. Um, so one of the questions that came through Prospero was, um, mm. do you know of any research exploring the experience of black senior managers and their experience of racism from their direct reports and peers said in addition to the Brockman research that you mentioned? Okay. Um, not off the top of my head in the UK. Certainly there is um, quite a bit 
coming out of the US. Um, so what I could probably do if, if people are interested, I could look at the reference because it's good to look at the references that they're citing sometimes and you might find um, particular ones. So not specific to social work, but I know that in nursing, when I did my doctorate in black nurse managers, if you like, um, they had disproportionate um, removals and, and, and demotions and fitness to practice, all of that um, performance management related stuff. So in nursing, yes, but in social work, I'm not aware um, of any recent ones. I can look I can look that up for whoever's interested. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, there was a there was a couple of questions around uh, reflective practice and um, and how so one of the questions was how can white managers and practice educators best support black and minority ethnic supervisees on an individual one to one basis um, and how can they, they provide that reflective space more often, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that, that's a huge one, I think. That's a really big one. I think that um, you will be working with different uh, staff, really, with different needs. So I think you'll need to think about that. I know that people have decided in some local authorities that they have group group reflections as well for uh, black stuff. And I, I have to say I have, um, I don't know what the word is, facilitated it, um, but they've wanted somebody from outside to facilitate that. And then the agreement has been if there's anything that's arising from here that we feel your management needs to know we will send back and some of it's just tears to be honest with you some of it's just you know dealing with that that level of emotion um so maybe that's one idea to look at some group group spaces or individual spaces um that's not part of the main supervision but but additional if needed that's brilliant. Thank you. And actually, one the person that asked the question answered it themselves as well a couple of times. They said, <laughs> okay. you know, for example, starting a conversation about race and supervision and providing a space to talk okay. about race at work and in practice with families. I presume that means in, in you know with the people that we're working with. And so, mm. um, yeah, I think that's all really pertinent. And yeah. so, just um, one final one. Um, I it's we like this one, so we wanted to ask this one. What are your thoughts on unconscious bias? I yeah. feel increasingly uncomfortable about this concept and question and where it fits with an anti-racist approach to practice. Yeah, I think that the, the general view is that when you start talking unconscious bias, you're giving people a, a, a get out of jail card. I think that's the general view. Oh, it was unconscious. My argument is how many unconscious bias situations do we have to be in to then say, OK, this this is beginning not to be unconscious bias. I think that um, we need to recognize that all of this is ingrained in us and we just need to accept it as that as it as is so or okay I didn't quite think about the impact of this statement on you not oh it's from my it's my unconscious bias so again there are some local authorities that would prefer training on in unconscious bias and I think that perhaps is a gradual way for um, getting into the conversation for people who are completely a new to it or b resistant. I'm a believer that we have to work with people at where they're at. And so you will hear me sometimes say, yes, I do agree with um, uh, unconscious bias only because that's what some people can take today. And then we move on to say, however, these are the, the, the disadvantage of unconscious bias. We need to move beyond that. So uh, as I say, I work with people where they are. If you want to call it unconscious bias today, I'm hoping that with time, we will learn and we will move along and, and, and stop calling it that. But it does give people a get out of a jail card. But I absolutely do also believe that some of the things we do are not intentioned. However, we know it's not about the intention, is it? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, really really amazing questions thank you for all your questions that is all we have time for i'm really okay. conscious as well that there's been questions and um right challenge to social work england through this presentation and thank you for that um and you're right we did um publish a statement of intent okay. around equality diversity and inclusion just earlier um in february so you can find that on our website and it sets out our three-year ambition for um both us as a regulator and employer and an organization and the different um ways we need to tackle this um, so also tomorrow morning at 9.30, there's a session with our um, chief exec column and our, um, mm. our chair, and I'd, there will still be tickets available for that up to an hour before. So that's a great okay. opportunity to come and hear about um, us as a regulator and what we've learned over the last year in particular. So thank you again for that. Yeah. Um, and just before we end, I want to come to Laura, our illustrator, and just see um, what she, how she's found the session and what she wants to share with us today. Laura, are you there? I am. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to do the, the terrifying thing, which is trying to share my screen now um, and we'll see if it works. Can you all see this? 
Well, when I'm looking yes. at you, because yeah, because you're, you're the only person I can see on my screen. I can see. Um, so this is an overview of what Prosper has been talking about today. I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to pick out three key things that, that I've taken from this incredible presentation. Um, the first of all was actually the wealth of evidence. I knew it was there, but I think when it's in black and white, it just brings it home. That suggests that those social workers from an ethnic minority are just disproportionately discriminated against, experience covert rejection. Um, and they're not being trained in the way that they should um, from compared to their white peers. That was number one. Number two for me was about reflection and actually not stalling on just the reflective bit, actually thinking, well, how can I take this reflection into action and what can I now do to operationalise some of these ideas I've had? And I really liked how um, Prosper linked this to George Floyd and some of the language and the um, kind of professional standards that were imbued in that whole discussion. And finally, I really liked the calls to action. So some of them um, were really specific, but broadly it's everybody's responsibility. And that's kind of glib on its own, but actually it's about from profession to professionals. So systemically, what can we do? And then what can we do as individuals? And it needs to start with individuals in order to kind of filter upwards. And we also need to think about our language and actions um, our continuous learning and how we can again push this reflection into practice and then push, pushing past the silence um, of black colleagues and how we can kind of remove this kind of shame and veil of silence and also challenging this idea of toxic positivity which I think has been very prevalent um, recently with, with Covid and the discrimination around that but I think again underpinning everything is that actually anti-racist practice is crucial because that is what your professional standards are all about. So how can we, you know, do what we have already said we were going to do um, in practice? So I hope that's helpful. This will be is already uploaded to um, the online gallery, which I believe I hope the uh, link has been shared. But thank you very much. I'll stop sharing and now. Thanks, Laura. Um, we Thanks, always Laura. love it. Yeah, yeah when Laura's in a session, gorgeous. it makes everything better. <laughs> because yes, you think, yeah. oh, it was so overwhelming. There was so much information. And then Laura's just, um, yeah, I know, it right? for us. Absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So thank you. And thanks again, Prospera. What an incredible yeah. session. Thanks for sticking with us an extra 10 minutes. Um, so don't forget great. to record your CPD. What amazing content to reflect on here. Um, and also to fill out our post event survey um, just to give us some feedback about this. This will be recorded and available after social work week so thank you again um okay. that's it for today um look forward to seeing you in the rest of the week okay thank you all thanks all for your help bye everyone bye